very often we talk about emotions and we mean feelings, we talk about feelings and we mean emotions, but the, the, the separation is very simple. Uh, when we talk about an emotion, we talk about something that is expressed in behavior, something that is expressed in a motor system. For example, a facial expression of uh, happiness or of sadness, uh, a posture in the body that reveals fear, uh, changes that occur in our organs that uh, some are away from sight, but a lot of the time can actually be visible. For example, changes in the skin uh, that introduce pallor, uh, or changes in hair, uh, and things of that sort. Uh, all of which are behavioral in the sense that they have a motor component, they are an execution of some kind of reaction, of some kind of response that is interestingly directed away from the subject. Now, when we talk about a feeling, in the proper sense of the term, you're talking about something that is not motor at all, that is not reactive in the traditional sense, but rather something that happens in our mind, that happens in the mind of the person who has the emotion. distinction is that a feeling is an idea or a thought or a cognitive process, whatever you want to call it, of something very particular, which is the process of reacting during an emotion or during any of the regulatory responses that we can lump together with emotions. So when we feel, we have the perception of what happens while we react emotionally. When we react emotionally, we have that, but not necessarily a feeling. When we think about how emotions occur and what triggers emotions, it's very useful to think about one concept that I have introduced. It's purely for work in the laboratory, it's part of a model, and that's the concept of emotionally competent stimulus. So what is an emotionally competent stimulus? It is some kind of object or some kind of situation that either because of our evolutionary history or because of what we have learned in our own life has the capacity to trigger an emotion.
the emotions that I have studied are the ones that have a unique uh, snapshot expression. By that I mean an expression that you can capture in a moment in time. A highly efficient evolved signal. Uh, not something that you have to take four or five seconds in order to signal, but something in an instant signals to all members of the species something about what's being felt and what's the processing that's occurring in the person's mind. If we use that criteria and we look just at the face, and we shouldn't look just at the face, we should also listen to the voice, but let me first say what the face tells us. It tells us there are seven emotions, anger, fear, sadness, disgust, contempt, the feeling of being morally superior, surprise, my initial work I did in literate cultures. They were easy to get to in Brazil, Japan, Argentina. Uh, and using Darwin's method, I showed people faces and asked them, what emotion do you see? And uh, they all virtually came up with the same emotion, the majority in every culture I studied. Uh, if I showed them a, a fear picture, um, they would say in their own language, uh, fear, or an anger picture that was, a picture judged anger in the United States or England would be judged as anger in any of these other literate cultures. But I knew there was a loophole that you could, if you were a dedicated cultural relativist, as Margaret Mead was, and as most people were at that time, you would say it wasn't uh, our evolutionary heritage, it was the media, it was Charlie Chaplin and John Wayne, it was watching people on television and on the movies that we all learned the same expressions. And the only way to answer that was to find a visually isolated people who had never seen film or television or photographs or magazines and who had no out contact with the outside world. I made two trips, one in 1967 and one in 1968. And everything that uh, I was doing was so novel. I mean, these people had never seen themselves in a mirror. They had no still water, so no reflection of themselves. Uh, they'd never seen a match. Uh, I mean, every, all the things that we take so for granted were just totally novel to them. Now, of course, they weren't camera shy. They didn't get embarrassed. They didn't know what a camera was. They'd never seen a camera. Uh, which was a great advantage. I could walk around all day putting this funny odd object up to my eye and they didn't know what it was about, so they didn't get self-conscious. I was showing them photographs, usually in sets of three, and telling them a story, like um, one of these three people is seeing friends that they like, point to the person. Well, of course, some anthropologists had written that you have to learn how to see photographs. So it wasn't initially, well, that's not true. These people had no problem. Uh, they also, it didn't really matter whether I showed them Caucasian photographs or the frames I pulled out of their film. It was just this, this funny, odd thing that I was asking them to do. So they would point to the photograph. Um, I also, uh, with other people, I told them the story like you're seeing friends. Show me what your face would look like if you were about to fight. Show me what your face would look like if your child had died. And so they made the expressions and I filmed them. I took the films and I showed them to college students in America. And I asked them, what emotion is it? Well, if Darwin was wrong, they wouldn't have been able to tell me. They would have made mistakes. But of course, it was just as if they were seeing their next door neighbor. So this was really very, very strong evidence of the universality of expression.
There are universal themes that I mentioned that reflect our evolutionary heritage. What we get emotional about is both things that are the result of phylogeny, our evolutionary heritage, and ontogeny, our own development. What the appraisal process is sensitive to is what was important to our ancestors, not just what was important to us. The benefits we get from what was really useful for our ancestors are stored in our own brain. They, I believe the reason why we do all that we do is in order to experience certain emotions. That it's not hunger or thirst or sex. I mean, the sex drive is trivial compared to the power of emotion. You may never have sex because of your fears. Fear beats sex. So does disgust beat sex. Emotions are the primary thing that motivate our life. And then the last thing I already mentioned right at the beginning is a signal. That there is the utility of emotions is that other members of our species know what's going on. And that sometimes we might want to hide it, but by and large, in our history as a species, when we really have been part of cooperative groups, it's been more useful to us than not for others to know how we're feeling at the moment. Pour que l'âme puisse être mue par le corps sous l'emprise de la passion, il faut bien qu'une matière corporelle agisse sur notre esprit. Intuitivement, Descartes cherche dans le cerveau l'organe des échanges entre le corps et l'âme. Or, je vous dirais que quand Dieu unira une âme raisonnable à cette machine, il lui donnera son siège principal dans le cerveau. Et la fera de telle nature que selon les diverses façons que les entrées des ports qui sont en la superficie intérieure de ce cerveau seront ouvertes par l'entremise des nerfs, elle aura divers sentiments. 